It's a great privilege to be here with you today. My name is Gottfried of Seymensa. I think some of you here who are a little older will remember me. When I graduated from university in Birmingham, I came back to Ghana and I was working with uh, mobile oil in Ghana House at that time when we were based. And uh, I traveled for them for about five years uh, supplying mobile, mobile oil and other things to sawmills in Kumasi and the, um, uh, to the um, uh, mines in uh, uh, various parts of Ghana. <laughs> and uh, as I said, I worked with them for five years. And then I became a traveling secretary for uh, Pan-African Fellowship of Evangelical Students. Uh, which is the precursor of Garfis. And I traveled in Nigeria and Sierra Leone and uh, Liberia, and uh, as well as here in Ghana, visiting the universities and uh, trying, encouraging them uh, in their study of the scriptures, as well as in prayer and witnessing on the campuses. And then uh, I was... Uh, called to serve the church in Nairobi in Kenya. And so I spent another five years there with the uh, Nairobi Baptist Church. I had a congregation of about 1,200 and I had three services every Sunday. And after I had been there for a little while, I began to suffer from ulcers. <laughs> of course, a, a lot of uh, burden carrying. Anyway, then came the Lausanne uh, Conference for Well Evangelization in Switzerland, and I was drafted in there too. And uh, after the conference, uh, I was persuaded to serve as an executive secretary, traveling twice around the world, encouraging uh, Christians and churches everywhere to uh, form groups based on the Lausanne Covenant and to exp uh, find out what in their area still are, who in their area are still not evangelized. Uh, we call them the unreached people groups. And to find out what unreached people groups are in their countries or in their regions, and then when they have found that out, to try and devise some effective ways of bringing the gospel to them. And uh, so that was my work for five, another five, no, another nine years. I was traveling around the world and encouraging world evangelization. And now I am based in Reading. I'm a member of the uh, Anglican church there called uh, Grey Friars Church. I have opportunity of preaching there from time to time, and uh, it's a great privilege to be here today among you. The psalm that was read to us, 119.89 to 93, that it begins by saying that your word, what is it? Your word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the, air, in the heavens. Your faithfulness continues through all generations. You establish the earth and it endures. And your law endures to this day. I would like us to pick up that God's word is eternal. And God's word is eternal because God is eternal. The one who spoke it is eternal. And the word he spoke is eternal because he doesn't change. He's always the same. We are told in, uh, elsewhere in the scriptures uh, that uh, God is not a man that he should lie, 
nor the Son of Man, that he should change his mind. Numbers 23 and 19. Now from the psalm that was read to us, if we carried on reading a little bit more, the psalmist actually was telling us that there are a number of proven facts as a result of loving the word and reading it and so on. And he tells us some of them. He said his life was preserved by God's precepts. Now, he doesn't go into detail as to how his life was pre preserved in that way. But he's, he's giving a testimony that the word that he had re reading uh, had a, an impact on his life. And God always, God's word always has an impact on life, on the lives of those who read it and who love reading it and who meditate upon it. His life was preserved, he says, by God's precepts. Verse 93, loving and meditating on God's law made him, he said, wiser than all his teachers. And he had understanding, he says, than all the elders. Verse 100, obeying God's precepts kept his feet from every evil path Verse 119 and verse 9 to 11, we read there uh, concerning uh, uh, a, a question that the psalmist asked. How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. Seeking you with all my heart, do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, O Lord, teach me your decrees, and my lips will recount all the laws that come from my mouth. Now, it's not long before our king is crowned, and no doubt the Bible Society will have a special version or uh, edition uh, to be presented to His Majesty with some words to the effect that this is the most precious thing, the Bible, the most precious thing that this world affords. God made a decree and He commanded Israel that when they set up a king, well, He's a, he, he told them what they should do, what the king should do. This is what the Lord said concerning the king that uh, Israel might uh, set up for themselves. Deuteronomy chapter 17 and verse 18. Sorry, I'm getting there. It's when the king, that's the king who is anointed to serve Israel, when the king uh, takes his throne on his, in his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law taken from that which is with the priests and the Levites. It is to be with him, he is to read it all the days of his life, so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God and follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees, and not consider himself better than his brothers and turn from the law to the right or to the left. Then he and his descendants will reign a long time over the kingdom in Israel. So God is giving orders concerning any king who sits on the throne, the throne of David in Israel. He is to make a copy of the law and the, 
uh, ordinances. He is to write it himself for himself. Borrow a copy, the copy, the original from the uh, 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 from the priests and the Levites, and then he is to write it uh, for himself, and then read it every day or throughout his life, and then he will be able to last on the throne in Israel. Now the psalm, the psalm is uh, telling us about some proven facts because he also read the scriptures and meditated on it. He says he delighted in doing so. And these are some of the things that he says. Obeying God's prefects, he says, kept his feet from evil, from every evil path. He encouraged his servant, the Lord also encouraged his servant Joshua uh, that he may tread the same path as what the priests have said. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. Both Peter and Paul tell us how we came to uh, have our Bibles. Peter writes, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. And Paul writes, all scripture is God breathed. So scripture came from God breathing it out, as it were, God speaking it out, as it were. Scripture, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. I like to interpret that in this way. It is profitable for teaching God's truth, for rebuking our faults, our errors, and correcting our faults so that a man or a woman of God may be completely equipped, fully equipped for every, everything, every good work that God wants him to do or her to do. Rebuking rebuking errors. Now, some of the er errors that uh, uh, I think needs rebuking in this country, particularly among certain class of uh, uh, believers, is polygamy. Ghanaians are still talking about polygamy. Polygamy, even Christians are talking about polygamy. That is a fault. Uh, that, is, that is something to be rebuked. In Peter, we are told, uh, Peter writes like this. In 1 Peter 1, 18. You know that it is not a perishable thing such as silver and gold that you, by which you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish and without defect. And those futile ways handed down to us by our forefathers, including what I have just been talking about, polygamy. The Bible calls a futile way handed down to us by our forefathers. But you see, we have been redeemed from all that by the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we do not go back to that from which he has paid so dearly to deliver us. And then the other thing is that he rebukes. Uh, 
but I've come to know as a pastor, but also as a Christian leader in different places. Here in this country and elsewhere, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. But there are husbands that think that it is their right to beat their wives and to carry out all kinds of uh, um, all kinds of uh, signs of hatred for their wives. That is something which also has to be corrected, corrupted, corrected by the word of God. We are to love our wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her that he may sanctify her and that he may provide for her both to nourish and to cherish her. And we have to be corrected by scripture. And there, there should not be any, any thought of any Christian having anything but love for his wife and the wife responding in the same kind of way. God's word is eternal. The truth that he has given to us is to be with us. And as he advised uh, uh, Joshua in his day, we are to meditate in it day and night. We are to let the word really seep into our being. Because that's the way in which the Holy Spirit turns us into Christ's likeness. He sanctifies us into Christ's likeness. He takes Christ's righteousness and he imputes it to us when we become Christians. That is what is, what is done to us in our justification. But he takes the same righteousness of Christ and his purpose now is to impart that righteousness to us so that we become more and more like our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the process of sanctification which follows our justification. It is the Holy Spirit who does that work in us. It is the purpose of our Father, we are told in Romans chapter 8, that he predestined us to be conformed to the image of his dear Son, so that his dear Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, may be like the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And that work is entrusted to the Holy Spirit, and it is he who takes the word of God, applies it to us, as we read it, and then he sanctifies us in Christ's likeness. In 2 Corinthians and chapter 3, and uh, verse 16 and 17, no, no, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and verse 18, 17 and 18. We are told that when we read the scriptures and see the Lord Jesus Christ in the scriptures, as we focus on him, that same image 
is being reproduced in us by the Holy Spirit. So we are conforming to Christ's image from one degree of glory to another. As by the Holy Spirit, that's his work. And he does it in us each time we turn to the scriptures. So the word comes alive and it begins to do its work in us to make us more and more like our Lord Jesus Christ. The old word becomes new in us, and we become more and more like our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the word that is given to us. We are to be conformed to the image of our Lord Jesus Christ, and it is through his word that the conforming takes place. Oh, how I love your word, your law, I meditate on it all day long. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they are always with me. I meditate on your statutes, he says. I find more understanding even than the elders. That is God's word for us. There is a practice which I was introduced to 10 years ago, and I have found it a great blessing, and I would like to commend it to you. Make it your New Year's resolution every year that you read through one version of the scriptures throughout the year. I am not talking about using passages from it to preach or to teach something, somebody. I'm talking about reading through it. Read it as you read any good book. And read it through. Make sure that you read through one version of the scripture throughout the year. And then you go to another version. In the new year, you begin the same thing again. I have carried on doing this thing for 12 years now. And I find that a great blessing and a great way of cooperating with the Holy Spirit in his work of sanctification with the Word of God in my life. The latest version that was given to me by someone when I was last year uh, in Ghana was the Asante Bible. It had recently been issued by the Bible Society. And I have read through that twice one in one year, and the next next year, a little quicker, uh, read right through and finish it uh, in a record time. And it is also beginning to improve my understanding and my speaking of the Asante language. I commend that to you. So that is the passage which is given to us. God's law, we love it. We, 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 we read it every day. We study it. And the Holy Spirit does his work, taking it and sanctifying our lives with the word. I pray that that may be true of you also, that your word will be like a lamp to our feet and a light on our path, and that we will grow as we get to know the scriptures. Not just to preach it, but let it do its work, sanctifying work in our lives. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Father, we pray that your word may have its effect in our lives. We pray, Lord, that you will lead us to really covenant with you, that your word may dwell in us richly in all wisdom. We pray, Lord, that you will help us to find out 
a way of studying your word so that it is having its impact in our lives. We thank you, Lord, that you provided it for us and preserved it for us over the years. We think of so many people like Tyndale and others who paid for their love for this word and the translation of it into a language that we can also benefit from. They paid with their lives. So many who were martyred because of their love for your word and their translation of it and their working in it. And we pray, Lord, that you will grant us grace to appreciate that. We thank you for the Wycliffe Bible translators. We thank you, Lord, for the work that they have done to provide the scriptures in the language, many of our languages in the north, so that the church there also may have the scriptures and benefit from all the uh, uh, wealth that there is to be found in your word. We pray, Lord, for them and for missionaries who are working among them, helping them to be able to read the word and to understand it. We ask, Lord, that you bless your servants who labor with your word so that others may come to enjoy the blessing that we take for granted. We ask too, Lord, that you will bless churches where your word is preached Sunday by Sunday. We pray, Lord, that you will help us to do better. And we ask, Lord, that your word may really sink into the minds and the hearts of members of our congregations. So we commit ourselves into your hands and pray for your word to have its power and impact on our lives and through us, in the lives of others. And we ask all these messages in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We appreciate you joining our service today. Please subscribe to our channel by clicking on the logo and don't forget to like and share. See you next week. God bless you.